Hello, everyone, and welcome to Future of Data and AI. I'm your host, Raja Iqbal. It is my pleasure to welcome Amr Abdullah to the podcast. Amr is a serial entrepreneur and a prominent name in cloud computing industry. We'll talk to Amr about the journey as a technologist and his work at Yahoo and Cloudera and his most recent startup, Vectera. Welcome to the show, Amr. It's good to be here. Okay. So, Amr, let's start with uh, going back to you know, you have been a prominent name in cloud computing industry. While I was in grad school, I mean, I looked up to you as a grad student. And you were at Yahoo when Hadoop was born. Correct. Tell us more about it. You know, Hadoop was born out of the, out of the need for being able to process tons and tons of data. So yes. how did that need emerge? And tell us more about it. Yeah. So first, I want to tell you briefly how I ended up at Yahoo, how, how I came to be at Yahoo in the first place. So I... Uh, started uh, a company in 1999 with a co-founder. Uh, his name is Ty Tran. And uh, we were one year old, five people uh, in 2000 when Yahoo acquired us. So I ended up at Yahoo because of them acquiring my first company. Uh, it was a small acquisition. We were five people, one year old. Uh, $9 million was the acquisition value, but that was good for my first one. The product that we had was a comparison shopping product. And when we were acquired into Yahoo, we, be we became the back end for Yahoo Shopping. Yahoo Shopping was their main property that uh, crawls the web for product information, specs, prices, images, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I spent about uh, three years in the Yahoo Shopping team integrating that technology. But then I switched to a role which was focused on uh, data science and uh, business intelligence, uh, helping a number of key Yahoo products like Yahoo Search and others to optim optimize their performance based on user interaction. Uh, we had a very large uh, business intelligence uh, data science installation, but it was based on Oracle. So we're leveraging Oracle. Uh, back then, Oracle has a technology called Oracle Rack. And Oracle Rack is the clustered version of Oracle, which allowed you to install Oracle on multiple servers. And that was our main data warehouse. It was struggling. It was struggling uh, and giving us lots of pains. The main pains that we had, uh, the first one was scaling, just scaling pains. Not just were the queries slow to run, loading the data was becoming a problem. Uh, it was taking about a day to load a day worth of data. So you can see how eventually that won't work, <laughs> that you'll be getting more data than you can load. So that was the number one problem, was the scaling problem. Uh, the number two problem was the performance and latency of uh, queries as we were issuing them. Also, that was a big problem. Like some of our uh, queries, in fact, I remember we had a query called the monster query. It was a very large SQL query that was uh, merging all of the click information with the impression information and deduping that on a per unique cookie basis. Uh, a very simple query, but uh, execution wise was ex incredibly taxing. Running that query just for one day worth of data would take five days to finish. The query would take five days to finish. So obviously that was not uh, going to work. We need something different. And then the third problem was just the problem of not all questions we wanted to ask were SQL questions. Like SQL is great. It's a very powerful language. I love SQL. But some of the more involved data science questions, as you know very well, need to go beyond SQL. You need to do some programming as part of that. And the SQL environment supports UDFs, user-defined functions, and stored procedures, and all that kind of stuff, but still very limiting. It wasn't very capable in terms of allowing us to go beyond SQL as a way to leverage our data. And then I was lucky while, while I was running that team at Yahoo, that was a very large team, about like 90 people responsible for this kind of stuff. There was a separate team within Yahoo uh, that was uh, uh, responsible for Yahoo Search, and they were also struggling with scaling the Yahoo Search back uh, backend. And they have seen these great papers from Google about MapReduce and about uh, uh, distributed file storage, Google GFS uh, uh, was the, the name of the technology that the paper was based on. And they said, hey, maybe we should uh, borrow some ideas from Google and uh, build this thing called Hadoop. And they started building Hadoop within that team uh, for the purpose of Yahoo Search, right? That was mainly for indexing the web and creating a rich uh, page rank index and uh, et cetera, et cetera, to power Yahoo Search. Now, uh, I was complaining to one of them uh, that, hey, my queries on Oracle are running very slow. And he said, hey, maybe you should try running uh, Hadoop for this and see what it does for you. And I'm like, okay, I have this query called the monster query. Uh, can you help me run that? And he said, sure, let me let me do that for you. And he loaded a day worth of data. And we ran that monster query, which was taking five days on Oracle. And on a small Hadoop cluster, it wasn't a very big Hadoop cluster. It was like 20 nodes or something. The query finished in five minutes. So so five days, it was five minutes. And that was like, for me, that was a light bulb. Like that just went on. Like, okay, this is a new, clearly this is a new inflection point for data processing. 
And uh, I want to finish this for Yahoo, get them up and running with this. But as soon as I finish doing that, I'm going to be leaving <laughs> to start the company around this. And in fact, that's what happened in 2008. That's when I left Yahoo and started Clover. And Hadoop was uh, by that time uh, already released on uh, as open source project. Yes, yes. It was released as open source, but it was still very primitive at that time. Right? It was mainly MapReduce. Uh, there was a language called Pig, which was very cumbersome to work with. Uh, there was another language from Facebook called Hive, which also was a, a bit immature in terms of what it can do. So there were still lots of things that still need to be done to make the technology mature enough. But it was clear that this technology is the path forward. Like if you really want to scale your data processing and you want to have the flexibility to go beyond SQL, you needed something like that. That was very, very clear. Yeah. And then uh, when you uh, answered my next question partially, right? So you decided to move on. You thought that this is going to be something big. Uh, so you decided to move on and founded Cloudera shortly after you left Yahoo. Uh, and you worked at Yahoo for about eight years uh, and then you left. Correct. So I was yeah. Yahoo from 2000, 2008. Uh, in the middle of 2008, I actually joined first a VC firm called Excel Partners as an entrepreneur in residence. And that happened because one of my managers at Yahoo had left Yahoo and joined that firm as a um, as a VC. So when he heard them leaving, he said, hey, uh, come work here, research your idea, and just give us, the, give us the luxury of being the first ones to bid on it when, when, when you finish building the idea. And that was a very uh, important inflection point for me because at Excel, that's where I got to meet my co-founders for Cloudera. So I got to meet Jeff Hammerbacker uh, from Facebook and his team at Facebook. They had built Hive. So he was very, very instrumental. And he also coined the term uh, with DG Patel. He coined the term data scientist. So the term data scientist that many of us are using today, that comes from DG Patel, who was at LinkedIn at that time. And uh, Jeff Hammerbacker was at Facebook at the time. So I bumped into him and he joined. And then while I and Jeff were forming the idea... Excel Partner heard about two other guys. Uh, their name is Mike Olson. Mike Olson was the founder of Sleepy Cat, one of the very first uh, open source companies in the world. And he was at Oracle. They were acquired by Oracle. He had just left Oracle. And then Christoph Bichilia, who had just left Google, they also were thinking of doing something around Hadoop. And Excel was very instrumental in connecting us with each other. So we, they, we got to know about them. We got to meet with them. And we were literally the only four people in the world thinking about commercializing uh, this technology. So we said, hey, it's better off we join forces and build one company right now as opposed to compete with each other from scratch. Uh, we dated each other for a while, meaning, and that's one of the advice I always love to give people is you have to spend a lot of effort in picking your co-founders. Don't sign up with co-founders right away. You have to date them. You have to go out with them. You have to have arguments with them. You have to learn their mannerisms. You're going to be spending more time with them than your wife and kids. Like, like that's a, so, so, so take it as seriously as an engagement for marriage. Like it should, it should be something that, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the analogy that I often use even for hiring, uh, actually. Uh -huh. so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. you vet people out as if you are, uh, you know, getting married, right? So that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally. Totally get yeah, that. I would say that co-founding relationship is so uh, critical and it's uh, very emotional. It's not just work. It's not just you working there. That's the person you are relying on to build a company with you in the same way that you rely on your spouse to build a family with you. So yes, I cannot stress how you must learn not only how to work with them, but how to enjoy working with them because you're going to be working with them for very, very long hours. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, when you left, uh, did you have this idea? I believe Red Hat was around uh, at that time. So Red Hat was, you know, Linux, open source, yeah. building a business around it. So did you have a fairly good idea based on Red Hat model, uh, how Cloudera would look like as a company? That's a very good question. So uh, uh, there's two ways I can answer the question. The arrogant way was, of course, I knew, and this was going to work and everything was clear and but the truth of it is sometimes ignorance is bliss. <laughs> so I didn't know how hard it is to monetize open source. Like, so I thought it was just a good way of doing stuff. Now, I will give a lot of credit to my co-founder, Mike Olson. So Mike Olson, again, he was the founder of uh, Sleepy Cat, which commercialized uh, Berkeley uh, Apache BDB, which was one of the main uh, in-memory databases back then. And he was one of the very first companies that uh, figured out how to monetize open source in a healthy, scalable way. Uh, he had learned a lot of lessons from that journey with Sleepy Cat that then he helped us at Cloudera to implement that as part of commercializing Hadoop and it worked great. So like, if I look at our growth story with Cloudera and how quickly within like two, three years, we were very, very dominant in the market. Uh, when other companies do, doing it more in the closed way, they can take 
seven, eight years before they can establish a standard in the market. Uh, that, that uh, A lot of credit for that goes towards the open source angle, but also Mike Olson bringing in the experience of doing that before. Cloud computing has changed uh, a lot uh, since 2000. And uh, I mean, it's almost mind numbing. I mean, when you look at how quickly things are changing in the last one or two years, they have been just, uh, you know, surprising every how quickly things have changed. So if I ask you, I mean, you have been uh, since your time at Yahoo, I mean, around 1999, 2000 until now, what would you consider as uh, some of the most uh, exciting things or catalysts? Uh, it could be tools, technologies, any events, any regulatory changes, uh, people that have really shaped uh, the way we see cloud computing, computing or internet. And when I say this, it, I mean, include, you know, pretty much everything uh, that we see around us, right? AI, machine learning, data analytics. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so we have to give a lot of credit to uh, Amazon. Like AWS absolutely was the beacon that shined the light on how important it is to evolve the way that developers work, right? So if I go back to my first company, which I built in 1999, when we were building out that web service, uh, gosh, we had to spend like maybe four months, five months finding servers, buying them, going to the data center, racking them, plugging them into the network, configuring them, installing things. So we had to spend like four, six months just to get the server up before we can do any coding and now actually build the thing that we want to build. And today you can go and plug in your credit card and spend the, like 50 bucks and you can have an amazing POC built in, in, in like minutes, <laughs> right? So if I were to put my finger on one thing, I would say it's the combination of these effects. First, Amazon shining the light on it, like because that's how they were doing things internally and that worked for the rest of the world. But more importantly, if you look at the nexus of why cloud computing really t- took off, it's because it significantly improved the efficiency with which we as developers can become productive, right? It literally got improved by a thousand times. Like it, it's that significant of an improvement. Like back then it would take forever to get anything up, which limited who can do amazing things to a few companies and maybe very wealthy VCs that can fund these companies to go buy stuff. And But very quickly... It now became anybody in the room can build an amazing thing. I think that is it. That is the, the genius of uh, the cloud movement. And uh, that's uh, probably the most defining thing in terms of uh, the way we see technology. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's still happening right now. Like, uh, we're not done with that journey. We're not done with that journey. Like, that journey of simplifying uh, how effective and how fast developers can be is underway right now. It's still going. Like, the cloud was the first. And the cloud and microservices and serverless architecture scaling up, scaling down, and uh, very user-friendly uh, microservice-based APIs, self-healing systems, self-routing systems, self-correcting systems, uh, the data storage that just scales up and scales down by itself. All of these amazing things, that was the beginning. Now we're seeing the next iteration of that. We're seeing self-coding systems, right? We're seeing where I can go in and define my app at a very high level. And I see the code for the app coming out. And my job now is just to massage it to make it work, <laughs> right? So so it's going to get even easier. Like I see within five years from now, uh, even my mom, who is now almost 80 years old and never program- never wrote a line of code in her life, she mm-hmm. might be able to create her own app. Like that, 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 that will happen in our lifetime. She will go ahead and say, oh, I want to create this new app. It's called Snapchat. And mm-hmm. you take a picture and the picture disappears after five seconds. <laughs> and the app will come out from the other end. It's fully scalable, fully uh, secure, reliable, full tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. So the people who have the greatest ideas and execution plan would be the winners as opposed to the best coders? Is that? I think that will happen everywhere. That's not just for coding. That will happen in, in movies. That will happen in music. That will happen in, uh, in, uh, in law. That will happen in manufacturing everywhere. If we don't learn how can we leverage the AI to make us 10 times, 20 times more uh, productive and make us focus on the creative aspects of our jobs versus the mundane, repeatable parts of our jobs, then we will fall behind. So that's, uh, that's th- th- this is a true statement across all jobs. Like that is going to be happening over the next five years. So that, that is probably a very good segue into your current startup, Vectera. So uh, tell us, um, I, I understand what uh, Vector does, uh, but for a lay person out there who's listening, uh, yeah. what does Vector do? Yeah. So I'll give you uh, three definitions uh, in, in, vari- in, in, in varying levels of difficulty, <laughs> meaning the first definition is going to be very, very layman, very high level. Uh, you don't have to be an engineer to understand what we do. Uh, the second definition is a bit more uh, technical. And then the, the third definition is very, very technical. 
So the, the first definition in terms of what we enable is you to build an AI assistant for any business use case that you have inside your organization. This is really what we're about. We allow you to upload the data around that uh, application. Uh, and then you have a prompt on the other end that allows you to ask questions and get very smart responses around that data. Uh, today, it's focused on what we call AI assistance, meaning we are reading the information and giving you back the response. The response could be a document, could be an answer, could be a, uh, a, a draft, could be a, uh, a web page, whatever. Uh, that's what we give you back today. And I call that passive, right? It's passive mode where the AI is simply giving you uh, information in a new form that you leverage to do work. AI agents, which is we're very, very quickly moving towards that, are about read-write. So not only am I reading the information and giving you back an answer, I'm performing actions now based on that answer, right? All I'm, or I'm performing actions to get you more information to provide you a better answer. So uh, to give you a layman example, uh, that uh, maybe uh, communicates that uh, definition, uh, think of an HR app like Workday. Uh, Workday is an app that many, many uh, organizations in the world uh, leverage to manage HR within their companies. Uh, today, to take a vacation in Workday is very hard. You have to go read the manual <laughs> to figure out what to put in different forms because you're afraid you're going to make a mistake. Uh, and it can take you five, six minutes to, to do something that should be finished in no time. So as an AI assistant, what will happen is you will have an ice box sitting with you within that application where you can ask, oh, I want to take a vacation. What do I do? And then the AI assistant will tell you exactly the steps you need to go through to complete that task, right? But you have to complete your task yourself. So that's what we call AI assistance. And that's the current mode that most organizations are at right now is enabling these AI assistants that tell us the steps. The future, however, is AI agents. So the AI agents will do the work for you. So when I say, how can I take a vacation in that uh, chat box, the chat box will resp respond back Instead of telling you how to take it, it will respond back and say, I can do that for you. When are you leaving? Say, I'm leaving on this day. When are you coming back? I'm coming back on this day. What's the reason why you're taking vacation? Oh, from my paid time off. Thank you very much. Vacation filed. Right? So that's going to be the future we're moving in where all of the apps around us will be completely working with us in the same way that we work with each other. <laughs> Meaning just by regular English or uh, Arabic or Chinese or whatever communication. Right? Just say what you want, uh, written or, or, or spoken. So that's the first definition. So we are about AI assistants and AI agents. Now I'm going to step down, uh, as I said, uh, in terms of definitions. Now, if you're going to be deploying AI assistants and AI agents within your organization as a business, so now I'm talking to the business users, one of the key things that business users need to be aware of is, to, is, is that these large language models today hallucinate a lot, a lot, right? So un, unaided hallucination, meaning when you don't give them the data with the response, can be as high as 60% meaning 60% of the responses you're getting back have something in it that's not factual, that is made up. And that can be very, very dangerous in a business context, obviously. If you're a lawyer uh, or a bank or a, uh, a doctor, you kind of just can't have that. There was many stories last year about lawyers actually losing their jobs and getting disbarred because they use ChatGPT without double-checking the output from ChatGPT. So that's the, the number one problem that we solve, is we solve the accuracy and hallucination problem to give you the confidence that the responses you're getting back from the system are correct answers. And we, we call that trusted Gen AI, right? So it's Gen AI, so it's the second definition. So the first definition is AI assistance for business. The second de definition is trusted Gen AI. So it's Gen AI that gives you trusted responses that you can rely on as a business. And that also does security, explainability, and many of the other aspects that require in any uh, business that would be leveraged in technology like this. And then the third definition for the technical folks like you is we are RAG as a service. We are Retrieval Augmented Generation as a service. Uh, we give you a very simple API where you can upload your documents on one end of the system. And then on the other end of the system, you can issue any prompt or any query you would like. And the system takes care of everything in the middle for you. Finding the right needles in the haystack, retrieving the right needles in the haystack, meaning the right passages and paragraphs and all of the documents you uploaded, re-ranking all of these. So I have another model that re-ranks all of these facts in the right order. And then we pass all of these facts to the generative model, which then produces the response with proper explainability and citations while minimizing hallucinations. And then for added protection, we have a final model that's called the hallucination detection model that checks these responses for accuracy and gives you a score for every response, telling you this response is perfect. You can send this back to your end users. You can file this legal draft. You're not going to get fired. Or no, this response, you should read it more carefully. Something might be off in there. Yeah, that is great. 
So earlier days, back in grad school, building a model, a machine learning model, it was uh, many things that we did uh, as our PhD dissertation. Now it is available maybe as a single library or single function call in R or Python or MATLAB, right? So a lot of this ha has been due to open source. And you have been a big proponent of open source. Your second startup actually was all about open source. Yeah. So uh, do you think that uh, the companies that have closed source models like OpenAI, will they be actually leading or it will be more open sourced uh, models? Uh, so where do you see this whole thing going? Yeah, I, I love this question. This is a great question. So first, I want to highlight open source is a means to an end. It's not the end, right? So there's some people that think open source, I want to do something because it's open source or I want to build an open source company. No, you, you try to build a company that is, for, in our case, we're building AI assistance, right? In Red Hat's case, we're building an operating system. And then open source is it, or Cloudera's case, we're building a big data platform. And open source is a way that you can do that in a business or run that business in a better way. Uh, the answer to your question, though, is both meaning both proprietary systems and open source systems over history, I get, at least if I look at history, and if I take a page out of history, both can exist and both can be successful. Like as long as the proprietary system is uh, well-funded and can keep uh, uh, innovating and advancing at a high enough rate to compete with the open source. So many examples of this in history, right? So if you look at uh, opening systems, uh, we have Linux, we have Windows. Windows is a very, very dominant opening system still. If you look at uh, the phones, we we have uh, Apple, completely closed, completely proprietary. We have Android, completely open. Both very, 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 very successful. So if you look at uh, models right now, large language models, we have uh, GPT uh, and we have uh, Sonnet and Claude, but then we also have Llama and we also have Arctic from Snowflake and we have Mistral. So I, I believe the answer is going to be both. You're going to have both open source options and uh, proprietary options. Open source will tend to win if the proprietary option is not good enough, then open source will win. And, and that happened in the opening system world. Like in the opening system world, Linux killed almost all other Unix flavors. Like there was, who remembers Solaris or who remembers Sun OS? <laughs> right? there, there was many really, really good uh, opening systems out there that disappeared after Linux came to be because they couldn't really exceed it. And so you either have to have a, a technical capability that goes beyond the open source uh, or in the case of Microsoft uh, with Windows, you need to have the ecosystem, like you highlighted earlier, that was a very valid observation, Raja, that is strong enough that will maintain you even as open source tries to compete with you. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And then, and then for Victara specifically, I'm a very, I'm still a very big believer in open source as something you should uh, use in your business. And that's something that's good. You're giving back to the community. So we're balancing that. At, at Cloudera, we were all open source. And I'll tell you, I would never do all open source again. It's very hard to run a business successfully at scale when you're all open source, because it becomes very hard to differentiate. And not only do you get big vendors like Amazon jumping in and competing with you uh, by just grabbing your open source, but you also get your customers uh, at some point telling you, oh, I'll just go hire five people to do this instead of you, right? Mm -hmm. right? I would rather pay people to do it than pay you as a vendor. So uh, my advice is you always have to balance how much open source you're doing as a business. And at Victoria, we chose that balance in, in a certain way where we're re releasing some of our models as open source, not all of our models. So, for example, one of our most successful models right now is a model called the Hughes Hallucination Detection Model, or HHEM for short. It's the number one model right now on Hugging Face for doing hallucination detection. So if you go to Hugging Face and just search for hallucination, you will see that the open source model come up. And then we leverage that model now to create also a leaderboard on Hugging Face, which ranks, it became now the industry standard benchmark. Every single model comes, they rank themselves and add themselves to the dashboard. So it's a leaderboard for what are the top models that hallucinate the least when you're doing RAG, right? So when you're doing RAG specifically, which model should I try to angle anchor myself to to minimize hallucinations within my infrastructure? So I highly recommend for those of you building uh, systems that I want to minimize hallucinations to take a look at that leaderboard. Uh, I will take a look you know, because uh, we are also building something uh, very similar. So let's move uh, a bit toward startups and entrepreneurship. You have spent more time as an entrepreneur, uh, I believe, than he spent in working for big companies. So tell me why startups fail. What would be the top reasons for a startup to fail? People. That's it. Number one reason for why startups fail is people. It's either you have founders that fight with each other, or you have uh, the management team is not the management team, or the founding team is not working uh, together in a healthy way, and it's not focused on the right thing to build a great company. Like they're not focused on the right things. They're 
maybe very excited about open source or very excited about AI. No, you should be excited about the customer and how solving the problems. <laughs> That's what you should be excited about. AI is the tool that you're going to use to achieve that. Uh, open source is the tool that you're going to use to achieve that. So it's the people and their experience and are they focused on the right things? That's the number one reason by far. The second reason I, I would say is bad luck. Like even if you're great, even if you're amazing, even if you're awesome, sometimes you will have bad luck. You came in at the wrong time. A big competitor comes in and just launches something that uh, replaces you overnight. Like that, that's bad luck. And that can happen. That can happen. And uh, when these things happen, I don't count them. Like I do some angel investments as well with entrepreneurs. If the reason why the company failed is because of people, then I would think twice before I invest in them again. Uh, if the reason why it failed is because of bad luck, no, I invest in them again 100%, like no problem, because I know that these things happen. And it happens to the best of us. Like if you look at Steve Jobs, like Steve Jobs, before the iPhone, he tried to make something called the Newton. I don't know if you heard about the Newton or you, you saw it. It was a few years, like five years before the iPhone. It completely failed. Completely failed. <laughs> Steve Jobs, right? Steve Jobs completely failed. Why? Because wrong time. It was the wrong time. The people were not ready for it yet. The technology was not ready for it. It was wrong timing. Great idea. Great team. Great market. Bad timing, right? And the bad timing is not under your control sometimes. So that's my long answer to your question. The, the number one reason why companies fail is people. Yeah. So choose your co-founders carefully. Everybody very carefully. Hire the first 100 employees. Hire the first 100, uh, 150 employees carefully. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so I interviewed the first 100 employees in all of my companies. I did that with the previous one, with this one as well. Uh, after 100, you can start relaxing that constraint a bit because now we have a good enough seed that this seed of employees now should hopefully spread the right culture, the right attitudes, and, and be at the right bar that you expect so that that keeps going on. But uh, you need that first 100. is so critical to your success. So you have to be very, very focused on that team that you're building in that first 100. And then you have to be very focused, of course, in your early years. First, you have to be focused, which most companies struggle with that. They they, just, they keep throwing spaghetti on the wall everywhere. Like, yes, you should be throwing some spaghetti, but not everywhere. You need to like have some focus, have some thesis. Otherwise, you're not going to have momentum, right? It's like how you hold a lens and there is rays of light that come in and you burn a hole. You're only, you're only going to burn that hole if you have focus. If you're not focused, you're not going to do anything, <laughs> especially against the big companies that have way more money and way more uh, people than you. So number one is focus is very, very critical. And you have to be paying attention to that. And number two is people and the relationships with the, between the people. And then number three is the mission. Is you, you need to have a very clear mission that you're working on this because you love it, because you're solving this problem that everybody cares about, as opposed to you're, you're just working. So always start with the why. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? Uh, so at the Victoria, our mission is we want to help the world find meaning, right? So the neural networks, the AI is very good at extracting meaning from things and helping you find that meaning so you can do something productive with it. So that so that's that's the mission that I resonate with and my, our team all resonates with and we believe in it and that helps us work harder and it also helps us guide our research strategy, our product strategy towards achieving that mission. Okay. So what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs? I see, I bump into people who are building Gen AI startups, right? So because that's where... Um, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. So what would be your advice uh, to uh, entrepreneurs, maybe f likely first-time entrepreneurs who are just taking the plunge on a Gen AI idea? What would you ask them to do and not do? Yeah, so the, the first uh, the first thing I want to say, and I'm going to say you should plug your ears if you prefer uh, ignorance as a bliss. You should put your hand in your ears right now and not listen to this one. <laughs> Uh, but you need to know that starting companies is really, really, really hard. It's really hard, right? We, like uh, many people think starting a company is easy. It's, uh, oh, I'm going to get funding. It's going to sit there. But no, starting companies is really hard. Uh, we see the press and the media, they only cover the successes. They rarely cover the failures. For every success that you are seeing in the media, for every company that's getting funded and growing, there is a hundred failures that you haven't heard of. In fact, I joke sometimes and say is the odds of winning in Vegas, if you were to go and gamble your money in Vegas, is better than if you were to start a company. Because in Vegas, at least you find out by the end of the day whether you have won or lost. <laughs> With starting a company, it can be five, six years before you find out what happened. So my number one advice is if you don't have strong resilience, if you don't know about yourself that you are a better person that can take punches and keep standing up again, don't do a startup. Don't do a startup. You're not going to survive. <laughs> so that's the number one advice. But that advice also correlates with because startups are hard and the odds are against you. If you look at the math, again, most startups fail and succeed. 
you will need luck to succeed. Even if you're amazing, if you are the top student in your school, you have 100 million in funding. If you don't have luck on your side, you're not going to succeed. So how are you going to get luck on your side? Uh, I usually say if you're religious, uh, which I am, then you, you want to go to your mom and you want to ask your mom to be praying for you. <laughs> so my religion is uh, the Islam religion. And Islam, we, we're strong believers that, that the prayers from the moms are more likely to be uh, answered than the prayers from uh, anybody else. So th that, that's number one. If you're not religious, then be uh, ask for karma. Ask for luck. Do good things. Go, do lots of good deeds so that karma comes back your way because you will need that, right? So, And I give the example of Steve Jobs. Then Newton, he didn't have luck. Newton fails completely as a device iPhone, just seven years later, changed the entire world, right? Because it was the right time and he had the luck on his side. He was great designer, great thinker, great everything, but he had the luck on, luck on his side the second time. So that's a very, very important piece of uh, advice. Second is start with why. Don't go build your company when you don't know why I'm building my company. And if you go build your company because you want to be rich, you're going to fail. Like any, any, and investors see this, by the way, one of the things investors, if I, if I feel that guy is pitching me because they just want to build a company and get rich, I'm not going to invest in them. I'm going to go somewhere else because the chances are people, they, they, there's lots of studies on this. The investors know that they look for that as a signal. Chances are that these companies fail. They are looking in your eyes. The investors, when they're talking to you, they're looking in your eyes to see, do you have a deep conviction about a problem and why you're solving that problem and how you're going to solve the problem? And once they see that, then they believe in you. And once your team sees that, your team believes in you. And once you have all of that positive energy and belief around you, then now the, the chances of you being one of the 10 startups that will succeed versus the nine that's going to fail is going to be way, way higher. So always start with why and don't get excited about the technology. The technology is simply a tool to solve the problem. Get excited about the problem and how I'm going to solve that problem. So that, that's very, very advo important advice. And it's maybe one of the key reasons why I see uh, some of the startups I work with fail is they lose the sense of why. Yeah. So what are you most excited about at Bacteria in the next six to 12 months in terms of technology, in terms of business, any opportunities uh, that you're looking forward to, anything that you can share, of course? Yeah. Well, I am most excited about agentic workflows, agentic workflows. And agentic workflows is this uh, evolution of uh, RAG systems and uh, these Geni-AI systems to not just uh, handle information uh, as in text documents that you have, but to also have the ability to call APIs. And as they call out these APIs, they can call in into databases, they can call in into uh, lookup systems with information, but they can also call APIs to take actions and do things on your behalf. So that evolves them to now be more than just simple knowledge retrieval systems, to be true workers working with you to make your business better. And that's very, very exciting for me. So um, in the next phase, um, what I will do is I will throw some rapid fire questions at you. Okay. okay. And uh, you will be given some choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, you choose one of them. And maybe you can say, because, uh, I mean, choices may not be as clear. Uh, you can one to two sentences why you chose one or the other. Okay. Or you'll say, no, I mean, I don't have an opinion or just, you know, but very quick. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, as you could have told during this podcast, I tend to, I tend to ramble a bit, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it quick, yeah. I promise. <laughs> okay. So out of all the models, uh, the large language models that are out there, Llama 3.1, GPT-4 Omni, or some other model, which one would you prefer? Wow, that's a very tough question. Because the answer is it depends. The answer is it depends on what task. If I'm doing a coding task or doing a summarization task or doing a business uh, reasoning, business planning task. So I'd say it depends. Can I say that? Is that no, the well, that, well, yeah. that, I mean, that whole point, right? So th there's no clear answer, right? So there's no one model that rules them all. Yeah. Depends yeah. on the task I'm doing. Yeah. And the questions are, I mean, so the way the choices are, uh, the reason they are uh, asked in rapid fire, it is because the choices are hard, right? So. Um, drag or fine tuning or both? Both. Both for sure. Yes, there are some use cases with which... Uh, I'd say for most use cases, RAG is the right answer. Uh, but there are some use cases where you're trying to uh, leverage not just knowledge as in information, but you're trying to leverage knowledge as in uh, either a style of writing, a process, a different type, kind of engineering process, a different type of legal process, then fine tuning would be required to teach the process. But if you're simply looking at information, uh, RAG with in-context learning, will handle 99% of the use cases. Yeah, so my answer is both. 
Yeah, I wanted to add something very quickly on it. So, see, I I, I told you I rambled a lot, and I, you just couldn't keep me in the no, mouth. I, I mean, please go back. <laughs> so, there is one very important uh, thing to note is it's not just fine tuning because people will say fine tuning with a large context window. If I have a big enough context window, like my context window is one million tokens, meaning I can put all of my data, all of my papers that you're indexing in the context window when I ask my question, then I will get better results. Even as context windows get bigger and fine tuning gets bigger, RAG systems still have their place because there's many use cases that require the extreme low latency that the RAG system is able to do. So very quickly, we find the needles in the haystack leveraging the vector database. And then these needles are the needles that we pass into the context window of, of the model. Now, if that model now was fine tuned also on my data, then I might get better answers because of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, what we did for a customer was um, uh, that we actually, for our embedding model, we actually fine tuned on their own data. So yeah. our retrieval is more efficient, right? So not really uh, fine tuning for generation side, but uh, on the retrieval side. And that actually is substantially improved the results because the embedding is being closer and all, all of that. I mean, we understand how this works, right? So yeah, I mean, uh, RAG is probably... Well, fine tuning the embedder is, is a much... Well, fine tuning the embedding model, yeah. actually. Uh, because the fascinating thing is that uh, if your retrieval is good, generation is going to be fine, right? So okay. the, I mean, most models will work fine. Uh, this is something that uh, does not come naturally to people because, you know, it's uh, LLMs tend to be the heroes of everything, but it is a retrieval actually that matters. Absolutely. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out as we keep exactly. uh, keeping that, right? So, yeah. yeah. So we did that and, um, and, and when we did it, um, it actually substantially improved uh, the quality of our retrieval, which in turn improved the quality of generation. Yeah. In terms of uh, enterprise adoption of Gen AI, what is the biggest barrier? Is it technology? Is it budgets? Is it the culture? Is it skill gap? Or is it something else? Fear. The biggest barrier is fear, fear of change, right? I saw the same thing with Cloudera, with big data, with Hadoop coming in. Like people were using databases like Oracle, Teradata, and we have to convince them to move something completely new. And the number one barrier is that people having the aptitude and having the resilience and the foresight to, we need to make this change. If we don't make this change in a few years from now, we're going to be toast. And that's the main barrier. Now, once you cross that barrier, uh, the barrier immediately after it is uh, the concern, and, and Gartner and Forrester will tell you this as well, the concern that businesses, there's three things. Number one, the concern that businesses have around the quality of the results, uh, because a lot of the initial implementations had hallucinations in them and had big liability issues. That's number one. Number two, the security and privacy of the data that you put in these AI systems. That's a very, very big concern. And then uh, number three is the shortage of skilled people like yourself that know how to work with these AI systems. So these are the top three barriers after fear. But I would say fear is the number one barrier. Fear of change is the number one barrier. Yeah. Okay. Impact of AI on workforce, jobs eliminated, displaced, or created? It's a very, very good question. The summary of it is net-net, uh, net-net. Jobs will be eliminated in, in massive amounts, net net. Let me uh, expand on that. So first, there will be a lot more jobs. There will be new jobs created. Because of AI, there will be people able to do jobs they couldn't do before, right? There will be somebody who will be able to be a director as good as Steven Spielberg, and they could have never done that before. So there will be new jobs created. There is no question about that. Uh, that said, this is one of the last skills that humans have, right? So when the manufacturing uh, revolution came with robotics and automation and machines, we replaced our hands, and now we're replacing our minds. So what's left? <laughs> so that doesn't take a genius to foresee that, no, there will be a lot more jobs lost than created in the long term. And in fact, many of our customers, when we're doing POCs today, like part of their proof of value for why we're doing this, we're doing this to improve our efficiency and need less junior people coming in. Or, or in the case of the manufacturing example I gave you earlier, we don't need to hire the technicians anymore. The workers can just fix the machines themselves. So jobs will be lost. Like, uh, I, I don't want to uh, sugarcoat that. Uh, and, and governments, and uh, it will take time. It's not going to be overnight. It will take a long time. But governments need to start being prepared for doing minimum basic income. We will need to do mi minimum basic income at some point. Or we'll need to create big jobs for people. You know, you know, in some countries, they have people that just press the elevator button, right? Their job is to stand in the elevator, ask you, which button uh, floor are you going for? And then they press the floor. And Egypt, we have some of those. And, and it's a useless job because I can press the button for myself. But we, we do it because we want them to earn some money. They, they, they have no other job to do. So we, we'll need to have universal basic income, for sure. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the existing big companies, 
how they adopted, how, how they actually leveraged this opportunity, the Gen AI opportunity. We have Microsoft, uh, we have Google, Meta, Amazon, Apple, or any other company that you can name. Which company has actually done a, a remarkable job in leveraging this to their advantage? Uh, I think that's very clear. There's one company that has done the most remarkable job in leveraging this to their advantage. The name is NVIDIA. <laughs> I think NVIDIA, NVIDIA absolutely is that company. They have been leveraging this to an advantage, both in terms of the sales they have been doing for the cards, but also leveraging the AI internally to build new things and new products. And like, if you look at the robotic stuff they're working on, if you look at how they leverage the AI to design new ASICs that they're working on, it's truly, truly impressive. So I, I have to give it to NVIDIA as the winner here. They, they okay. really that, 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 that's very true. And uh, a friend of mine was joking, actually, uh, a few weeks back, that uh, right now everyone is lo losing money except NVIDIA, right? So like all the companies are losing money. Customers are, enterprise customers, they are losing money. Uh, <laughs> it is only NVIDIA that is making money at the moment. That is very true. That is very true. That everyone is, true. is investing at the moment. Yeah. Now I would say runner, the runner-up to NVIDIA absolutely would be OpenAI with ChatGPT. I mean, ChatGPT is a massive, massive success. Let's not underestimate like how amazing ChatGPT is. And it's being used world worldwide. It's a massive brand. So I would put them as a runner-up immediately after NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. And you don't consider Microsoft to be, uh, because if you ask me, Microsoft would be, I mean, they, 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 they jumped on this opportunity and leveraged this and uh, incorporated this into their existing ecosystem. I think I, I thought, I mean, bringing OpenAI to Azure, that co-pilot and all of that, I thought that it was pretty, I mean, they leveraged it very well. But, well, yeah, NVIDIA definitely is the clear winner uh, yeah. here. In terms of uh, when you go and try to sell Vectera uh, to customers, what is the biggest barrier or biggest rather, I should say biggest challenge, you know, we've talked about barriers, but biggest challenge in adoption or using Gen AI, uh, is it the regulatory requirements? Is it the hallucination? Is it data quality? And maybe perhaps going back to it, the skill gap. Uh, once a company actually uh, adopts Gen AI, what is the biggest challenge in being successful yeah. in using Gen AI? Yeah, so I have a controversial answer for this one, and it's a bit longer to explain as well. I apologize. But the biggest challenge is, and I'm trying to find a polite way, way to say it, is the not invented here gene. The not invented here gene, meaning, meaning this. If you look at databases 50 years ago, if you, if you were to roll back in time 50 years ago, and you want to build a database, you had to go and build a database yourself. You had to go and get... The query planner, the query indexer, the SQL parser, the storage systems, and then you had to glue them together in the right way, and then you built your database. And and everybody was happy doing that, loved doing that, and so on. But over time, developers very quickly started to see that why are we wasting our time doing that when we can just buy a database from Oracle or whatever and finish building the thing that's going to make a difference for our business. And unfortunately, because of how new this rag space is. Uh, a lot of developers think, hey, we can just build it ourselves. Oh, there's this land chain thing. I can just get, grab land chain, grab this vector DB, grab that embedding model, grab that uh, generative model, and, and then build a pipeline myself. And yes, you can build a prototype very easily doing that. Yes. Now get that prototype to work in production with low hallucination, with accurate, uh, high quality results, with security, with no uh, data leakage, with no data privacy issues, with explainability being done correct, with the ability to call APIs, to do actions. And they start pulling their hair out. And, and not to mention uh, the enterprise readiness in terms of uh, scalability, uh, cost, uh, availability in different regions, disaster recovery, et cetera, et cetera. So we are going through a phase right now, and that's natural. I saw the same phase happen with Hadoop uh, with Caldera, where the developers really want to do it themselves. I want to build a rack pipeline myself. And they haven't really evolved yet into the next phase, which is, oh, I want to build this business logic application for my business so I can get my raise and earn my salary. I'm just going to use this solution to, to build this application because that's what they really need as opposed to reinventing the wheel from scratch over and over again and not to mention that they underestimate how hard it is as you said correctly during the example you gave with embeddings earlier about how fine-tuning the embeddings led you to build a much better system most of them don't know that they don't know how to do these things and they end up building very very crappy stuff so if you ask me what's the biggest uh, uh, friction point right now or not just with, for Victoria, but i would say anybody working in this space uh, in the rack space it, it's that it's a, how many developers out there thinking they can do it themselves, build it themselves, fail, which wastes about f four, six months, and then they come to work with you. Yeah, that's uh, great. Uh, last uh, question. 
startups, what is most important? The idea, the people, execution, something else? People, 100%. 100% people. Okay. 100% people. 100% is the most important thing is people. Uh, execution comes from people. Ideas come from people. <laughs> and uh, if you have a great idea, you have bad people, it's not going to work. Uh, you're not going to have good execution if you don't have good people. So it's people. Number one is people. And, and good people. Yeah, but bad people can actually turn a very good idea into a uh, failure. Right? So. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Amar, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you great, have a great rest of the day. 